so I, I'm, I'm very excited um, about this next session. Uh, Daniel Levinson, who is dad to Mira, will share resources that help families advocate for children with disabilities in a school setting. Um, he will then invite a group of adults who have older children with Kabuki syndrome, share their advocacy efforts in a variety of school settings throughout their academic journey. Welcome, Daniel. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and just pull up my screen and get it ready. Um, let's see if I can do that. I think I'm going to be able to make that work. And can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, and I'm swapping. Okay, can you see that, Janet? Yes, I can. Terrific. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm extremely humbled to be a part of uh, such an esteemed group of people uh, on the, the conference uh, docket today. Um, such a wonderful day already, and I'm excited about sharing about Pacer Center. I'm also humbled to be able to represent, um, talking about Pacer Center, um, a tremendous asset for families with kids with disabilities, both in Minnesota, but namely also nationally. And hopefully people can take away a little bit um, about some of the resources that they can access. And then as well, I'm gonna share a few pieces at the end of this portion of how uh, folks can, can access other resources in their areas. Um, but let me talk a little bit about um, PACER Center uh, at, a, at a high level. Uh, who is PACER for? PACER is uh, for families and their kids with disabilities uh, from birth through uh, age of majority. Um, it's also for educators and other professionals who work with students uh, with or without disabilities. And just for a little historical context, Pacer Center uh, is located in Minneapolis. It was started in the 1970s when the federal legislation IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, was signed into law. And it was put in place to try to help make sure families and their kids received the education that this law enabled them to get to be able to allow kids to experience the maximum they can in the educational setting. Um, and PACER has a whole host of programs. I'm gonna cover just a few, but um, there's a whole bunch of publications, workshops, and other resources that folks around the country can access uh, as well. Um, the mission for this nonprofit is, is pretty straightforward, to enhance the quality of life, and expand opportunities for children, youth, and young adults with all disabilities and their families so each person can reach their highest potential, a, a great cause. Um, and basically, you know, at a high level, PACER is a resource to help families advocate for their kids and get the best education. That's what the bread and butter is, if you will, for PACER Center. It's about education advocacy. And over the, the last 40, 45 years, Pacers expanded into a whole bunch of other areas to help champion for families beyond the education setting. Personally, we got engaged with Pacer, my family, because we, we uh, turned to them a couple times in the course of our daughter's educational years and uh, were immensely helped um, uh, throughout the process in championing for, for various elements of her IEP. I want to spend a minute or two just highlighting a few programs just to give a flavor um, of the type of work they do. One unique feature is the Simon Technology Center. It's an actual physical location that allows parents uh, and kids with disabilities to come in and try assistive technology to help increase their independence, access, and inclusion in both the school and other environments. You can literally go in, check out some adaptive equipment, like borrow it on loan and see if it works for you. Adaptive keyboards or back to, uh, adaptive mice for the computer and so forth. Another set of programs are puppet programs, which appeal to sort of younger audiences, fully volunteer supported, that brings uh, puppet uh, programs into young classrooms to uh, promote inclusion and dispel concerns and fears that ch um, children and adults have regarding disabilities. They also have a bullying puppy pr a puppet program as well, since children with disabilities are more than twice as likely to be bullied in the school setting. Other programs and services, um, multi, multicultural services. We have a host of um, advocates that can help in various languages and ethnicities. I mentioned a little bit about bullying prevention that was created about 10 years ago 
Uh, it helps uh, all kids who are being bullied, not just kids with disabilities. Another program that may have in be of interest to folks is the Center on Transition and Employment. This is for youth who are beginning to age out uh, um, and need support thinking about how they might look at housing or uh, career vocational rehab and stuff of that nature. And lastly, PACER has uh, both a, a lobbyist in Minnesota, but as well in Washington, DC to help shape public policy to support disability advocacy, a great tool to make sure that legislation is supporting uh, all of our kiddos. Um, a couple uh, just sort of fun facts, if you will, uh, PACER receives tens of thousands of requests for assistance. They take 45,000 calls a year uh, from parents who are looking for someone to help them with um, some form of education or bullying or what have you. Uh, there are plenty of workshops that are going on every week that are now, as a result sort of, of, of COVID, are now accessible nationally. Um, they used to be sort of more regional. And um, I can attest to the, some of the, the latter two bullets, which is, um, you know, a, a tremendous asset that, uh, that I appreciate. And, and I think, frankly, this is a bold statement, but, but all families with kids with disabilities um, probably have some have benefited from the leadership that this nonprofit has has served the community over the past 40 years. So what about uh, in the neighborhood near you? PACER is, is technically a parent training center. It may be a little bit more robust than some of the other ones around the country, but nonetheless, there are uh, almost 100 parent training centers across the country. Every state has at least one parent training center uh, if you're in a more rural state, but some states have lots, lots more than, than one. Um, and they provide a lot of the services that I just described that PACER does in a more geocentric uh, location for you. And if you're looking for uh, the parent center near you, you can use the link that I'm featuring here. And of course, all this uh, PowerPoint material will be available uh, to you. Last couple things uh, I wanted to call out. Um, there are uh, um, just a, a myriad of resources available to uh, families. Um, and here's uh, links to a lot of those, where if you're looking for information about bullying or you're looking for information about transition or uh, mental health services, which I didn't even sort of touch on, um, there's uh, uh, just a wealth of resources um, and presentations available uh, to everyone. And then sort of the last thing I'll call out on PACER, I have to do this, so this is a shameless plug. Um, tomorrow is PACER's annual benefit here in Minneapolis. So if you are on the, the conference today and in the Twin Cities, uh, feel free to join us. You can see me and my family. We've got Pentatonics, a, a huge uh, get for us. And this is important because it delivers 16% of our operating budget. So uh, just a quick sort of shameless plug uh, for uh, PACER Center. I'm gonna go ahead and unshare. Um, what I'd like to do now, just sort of setting the table for the next little bit is I'd like to introduce a video uh, it's a wonderful, heartwarming video. I just watched it yesterday, and, and everyone's going to love this, about a young uh, woman uh, tell a little bit about uh, her journey um, and um, some of the folks around her that support her. And uh, after that, she, uh, her mother is going to be a part of our parent panel. We're going to pivot after this video to speak to a handful of parents, fabulous parents of kids with Kabuki, and we're going to talk to them about the educational settings that their kids are in, and learn about the different ways that uh, that um, kids are, are learning in um, in various school settings. So I'm going to go ahead and have someone queue up the video, and uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. What did it teach you to sail? Were you by yourself? Yeah. Um, it taught me that um, as beautiful as the ocean is, it can be very, very unpredictable. <laughs> I can pretty much do anything if I put my mind to it. What were your directions for driving? Um, to go anywhere I want, just not crash anything. Rock on. I help look after the dog. I do my own laundry. Empty my own lunchbox. Make my own bed. I love horses. Um, I ride them every weekend. And I also look out stalls every single Sunday. I'm a prankster, so um, I like playing pranks, but Mr. Harris already knows that. I would say that Alex is a very happy little girl um, 
who is actually very stressed out and hiding behind a smile. She wants to please, but doesn't always know how to go about that, and, um, but deep down wants to do the right thing. Um, it's still a little bit hard trying to keep up with like the conversations because some of the kids like tend to talk fast. Um, it basically like gets my brain all confused because I can't like really keep up with the conversations. So I will like ask them what they're talking about so that way I know what they're talking about and I um, basically like taught myself that when I was like really well. So that's always very effective. I've never talked to her differently. I don't even think I did the first day getting to know her. I've just always treated her like someone who's a typical teenager. And she's a lot very passionate. Like if you hear her talk about horses or anything marine, animal, like she could talk for days about that stuff. She loves it. Her challenges are not common garden. She has had to work harder than most kids and will always have to work harder than most kids. She has difficulty with multiple systems. She's not just struggling with one. Alex now understands that and she has that and she engages in the learning and she works at it and knows I'm going to have struggles and I'm going to be successful but I have to work hard to make that happen. It's about meeting her where she is with certain things, fine motor skills, all of that, but the ideas are there. So to try to transfer what she's thinking and giving her a little extra time Maybe it's in discussion, maybe it's in planning mode, maybe it's to outline something. And then go step by step. I'm a really smart kid, so I think that I can definitely do like the harder questions. I'm hoping that if I do get bio next year, that Mr. Russo will give me more of like the biology questions that the other kids get because that way I can move on to marine biology if I understand biology. She never hesitates. That's the one thing everybody has to understand. She doesn't hesitate to meet the challenge. If you set the bar higher, she will work to get there, but she needs it to be set high. If you just give her this low bar, she's not gonna go any higher than that. She needs to be given a goal and she will reach it. She'll work harder to get there. Dad seriously put the video down. Fantastic. That was just wonderful. So heartwarming. And um, for a lot of parents with a kid with Kabuki, there's a lot that we can connect with in that video. Uh, I'm going to go ahead now and invite our panelists to um, come on screen with us and join us. We are joined, we are being joined by five uh, parents, five moms, uh, each with a kid with Kabuki syndrome. Uh, in a range of different uh, educational settings. And hopefully what we can take away from this panel discussion is that there is a whole host of ways that one can be successful in um, an academic environment for their kid. Um, so let's, let's start off just with an opener and have folks uh, tell us briefly about yourself and your family, uh, including sort of where you live, the age of your child with Kabuki syndrome, and just briefly, um, you know, what else you, you want to share about your family? We'll kind of just go through this. So, Bonnie, why don't we start with you? Uh, hello, um, I'm Bonnie Bogdanoff. Um, I am a pediatric physical therapist. So I work with all these types of children as well as have a son with Kabuki syndrome. Many of you might have met him last year. He was on the adult panel, Cameron Bogdanoff. Um, Cameron's 22. He's currently at um, a uh, program that's hosted at the College of New Jersey called the Careers and Community Services Program. It's a certificate program. It fosters inclusion at the um, college, as well as life skills, internships, and um, a lot of uh, good interactions. And it's very strongly supported by Best Buddies program. I also have a... Uh, a typical child who is an occupational therapist, also working in pediatrics now, and um, we live in South Jersey. Terrific, great. Um, Jody, do you want to unmute and uh, go ahead? 
Certainly. My husband, Rick and I, we've been married for 20, 22 years and we have four children. Our oldest, Joshua, has Kabuki syndrome and he's 19 years old. He presents with, like many of our children, right, intellectual disability, hearing loss, hypotonia, and sensory challenges. And he also has two sisters and a brother ages 16, 14, and, and 8. And we live in Los Angeles County, California. Terrific. Tiffany? Good afternoon, everyone. I am Tiffany Matthews Lay. Um, my husband and I um, have a son who is 17 with Kabuki syndrome. His name is Nasir. Um, and we are in Baltimore, Maryland. Great. Okay. Um, let's go to uh, Dana. Now, a lot of the clinicians, they had a disclosure statement. And their disclosure statement shared all the different pharma companies they received cash from. So I'm going to do my disclaimer statement. Dana is my wife and my partner in the raising of our, our daughter. So that's my disclosure. So Dana, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, honey, for that, <laughs> <laughs> that introduction. I'm Dana Levinson. Um, my family includes you and our daughter, Mira, who's 14 um, with Kabuki syndrome. And so um, I'll leave it at that. Great. And do we have Tina on? Uh, yes. There's Tina. See? Can yeah. you introduce yourself? Great. Sure. Well, uh, Alex, you see, needs no introduction. Um, Alex is 17. We live in Madison, Connecticut. Um, uh, her dad and I are both journalists. And uh, Alex was born in London. So we did a little bit of the academics and diagnosis overseas and then came here. So we've really had a, a unique transition to see uh, different approaches uh, on all levels. Alex, not only um, as you saw, she rides, she's been doing so many things, but I, the proud mama boasts right now, she is a captain of the cross country team mm -hmm. and she is working as a docent um, at the Mystic Aquarium in Connecticut uh, talking about belugas. So we're quite proud. <laughs> wow, that's terrific. Okay, great. So now we know each other a little bit. Let's, let's talk a little bit because you all represent a different sort of arm of uh, a different educational setting. So I'd love us for, to, for us to talk a little bit about um, the environment that your child's in um, and um, sort of tell us a little bit about how you decided to choose that particular uh, setting for your child. Um, and then if there were other models you may have tried uh, first um, and um, what you think sort of the pros and cons are um, of, that, of that model for you um, let's just, let's start with that. So Bonnie, do you want to, do you want to start us off? Um, sure. So, so we needed to look at a transition type program, Cameron, it was, um, finishing up with the school district and he was, um, the last half of his schooling was in an out of district placement. Um, so we looked for what kinds of programs were available to him and, um, for anybody here in the United States, I'd recommend that you look at something called thinkcollege.net. It is, um, has program, it lists all of the programs for um, young adults um, at college level type of institutions. There's day programs, there's programs where you can um, live there and get the different levels of support so that these kids can continue to learn and grow um, with life skills, how to interact with the general um, public, not being in such a bubble anymore, like many of them are in their schools, and um, life skills, internships, those kinds of things. So that's what Cameron is doing. He's um, the, There's mentors at every aspect in his program um, to help him learn, you know, and, and participate in all of the activities at the uh, college campus. Terrific. Um, Jody, do you want to share a little bit about the, the, the course that you've chosen to take, uh, why you chose that, um, if you made any sort of left turns or right turns along the way, um, and uh, what you think some of the pros and cons are? Absolutely. So currently I'm homeschooling Joshua again. I said he's 19. Uh, we've been homeschooling him and his, uh, his siblings for 14 years. And way back in preschool, when he was um, three, he attended two different local um, special ed public preschool programs that were fantastic. And Joshua and I learned a ton from. So when it was time for kindergarten, his preschool teacher recommended a few different programs. And I went and visited those kindergarten programs and just really felt like I could do something similar 
or maybe even a little bit better at home. We really wanted to continue to support Joshua at home and not have him out of the home how many, so many hours a day. So, um, so we chose to homeschool. Um, and I always say that when a hundred different homeschooling families are asked how they do it, you're going to get a hundred different responses. It's so unique and individual because we're all unique. So after researching our options, I enrolled them in a public virtual charter school that functions as an administrative organization over our homeschool program. So he had a regular IEP with great one-on-one -on -one therapies. Um, and we, we continued to homeschool through that public charter school for about eight years. And then towards the end of middle school, this is where it goes into, you know, we made some changes, right? So toward the end of middle school, I realized that um, he really needed to interact with other people who had similar challenges. And, um, and, and, and so we looked into, again, all of our options, and we enrolled him in a special ed, a special day program at our local public high school that we had only heard great things about. So he attended that school and program for his freshman, sophomore, and junior years of high school. And then when it came time for his senior year of high school, he decided that he wanted to go back to homeschooling because he really preferred learning at home and with his family. Again, his siblings are also homeschooled, and we have lots of friends who, who do it as well. So I've always acted as his teacher and his one-on-one -on -one assistant. I work with him on all academic subjects. And then in addition, he completes other responsibilities um, independent living skills and has plenty of time to, you know, pursue the physical activities that he really enjoys and also the, the academic and just life enriching things that he enjoys. The pros are that I know is that I know him best and I can tailor the teaching to his needs. Um, the con is that it takes a lot of time and energy, but my husband and I decided right away that that was something that we would definitely be happy to invest in. So many homeschoolers, however, uh, choose to outsource that teaching and administration. Um, homeschooling can take on a myriad of forms. It's really simply just independent study facilitated by a caring adult. Yeah, that's great. And it's I, I love when you say you, you talk to 100 homeschool kids, you get 100 different. I, it really is a one size fits one, yes. not just for homeschool, but probably for, for all kids, regardless Absolutely. of the setting, because they are so unique. Uh, mm -hmm. Terrific. Uh, Tiffany, go ahead. Uh, yes. So I would say we have a very uh, diverse um, educational uh, plan to this point. So we started in pre-K in a um, public school in Baltimore that is tailored for kids with challenges and kids who have fragile medical needs. Um, so that they had what was called the Together program. So it was together at three, four, and five. So you had kids with challenges with their um, normally functioning peers. And the class sizes were small. There were maybe, I don't know, seven to eight kids in the class. And that was perfect for us because at that time, the steer was still in a feeding tube. And so not long after that, you know, we were trying feeding therapies at Kennedy Krieger and just trying to get him to feed by mouth. So they were on board. Um, they had the staff there who could help us through that process. And we loved it. So we were there for three, four and five. Of course, when it was time to leave, um, we cried and cried. And they said, no, you know, it's time for him to move on. He's growing. He, he's done well here. It's time for us to move on. So now we're in elementary school and we are frantic. And so I will fast forward, but I'll tell you, we were in public school um, for the next five years, and we went to three different elementary schools in five years. So that's a lot of transition for a little person. And we made a decision to move for various reasons. Either we didn't feel that the program or the uh, school was a good fit for him, or they didn't feel that it was a good fit for him. They didn't feel like they could meet his needs. And you know, those are, you have to have very candid conversations. And those conversations can be really difficult. You have to learn how to read between the lines sometimes. Because I find that unlike medical professionals, when you're talking about education and kids, you know, there are things that people can say and can't say. So, you know, you had to read between the lines, have very candid conversations, and we did. So we found we were in public elementary school. I'm sorry. Yes, public elementary school until his last year when he was about to transition into middle school. And we had a very candid conversation with his teacher, his special educator, his IEP mentor, and we sat down and said, we're going to have to look into an alternative for this year. Um, if I step back a little bit, um, they were struggling to be, meet his needs from an academic standpoint, but to do so, he was very isolated. 
So um, we did not like that model at all, but unfortunately that was the best they could do. Um, then he was able to socialize with um, kids his age during lunch and during physical education. But then, so you go from being isolated to being in a room with 40, 50, 60 kids. Now you have, you know, what does that look like in all of his sensory issues? And so we sat down and we said, middle school is going to be a challenge. For number one, you're, you're in large classes, you know, 30 or more. There are greater expectations for independence, not only for study, but just for traveling, for moving about the building, changing classes. What is that going to look like when you have hundreds of kids, you know, in the building during the day? Um, socialization, you know, Nasir is a people pleaser. He loves people. Um, he's friendly. What is that going to look like with, with, you know, normally functioning middle schoolers? Um, so we sat down and said, no, this we're going to have to do something. And at that point in time, we made the decision um, to move him into a private setting. Um, so now he's in private school. Um, his class size is about eight to 10. Um, he changes classes. He's been there since early years of middle school. He's now in high, in high school, what they call upper school. Um, we love it there. He loves it there. Um, I, I have to, to say that I'm going to back up a little bit. When Nasir was an infant, we received the best advice ever from both his medical professionals and from my mom. And their advice was to parent him like you would parent any normal kid. OK. And so in doing that, it is very important for us to place him into settings where he can present his entire person him and all of his uniqueness, 100% who he is. And so, you know, when he was about six or seven, he, he called me cutie, he's never called me mom. So at that point he called me cutie and he said, cutie, why do I have special needs? And I said, because you're a special kid. And so, you know, he knows that he's unique, but that's just a part of who he is. That's not a negative for him. Um, when I speak about his disabilities, I say he's differently able. He's not disabled, he's differently able. And so, you know, part of that, rearing him and him being able to bring his entire self is we want him in environments where you know people understand his challenges and he can be his whole self. So I've said all of that to say that um, at his school he can participate fully. Um, from an academic standpoint, he's doing well. They're able to meet his needs with accommodations and we can support that at home. But it was just as important as it was academically, the social piece was so important to us. You know, he's in an environment where they have sports. He can play basketball and volleyball and flag football. Um, they have theater. They have two plays a year. Um, he's participated. In fact, he's going to be in the winter play in December, um, Hansel and Gretel. They have clubs and proms and dances. And, you know, he's in an environment, I feel, where he's the rule, not the exception. And I love it. He's just flourishing there. He loves I, I it. I love it. Um, you know, we love it. They have two Cocker Spaniels that live at the school. They kind of roam around. It gives you like a homeschool feel away from home. That's so terrific. It, it really um, has been a great experience for him. And he loves it. He loves it. And they love him. So that, awesome. that's sort of our experience. You know, uh, thank you. That's that's terrific. Uh, and and I, I, what, one thing that I think is terrific, uh, a theme that that among many awesome things you just shared um, is it constantly requires sort of reassessing and pivoting and looking. You, you may not find one approach uh, that works the entire time and you may need to revisit and say, hmm, maybe private makes sense for us. Let's keep sort of reassessing. It's a, it's a great sort of uh, um, uh, element. Uh, Dana, do you want to go ahead? <laughs> Sure. Yeah. So um, Mira is in middle school right now. She's in eighth grade, but she's almost 15. So we did two years of uh, kindergarten, um, but she's been in public school the whole time. And it really started for us with early intervention through the school district in our home from birth. And um, but thinking about that reassessing, you know, I think our approach was um, in, in, as long as we're advocating and we're getting what we want and the, the team and the school is supportive, then we, we don't need to change. When, when that's, that system breaks down, then we can rethink you know, um, what's working. But we've had only positive experiences with the public school system. And that's looked a little different as she's gotten older with, um, you know, she has a combination of paraprofessional support in the classroom with a couple of smaller resource classes, um, 
pull out kind of situations, but she's thriving and she's doing well. And I just think back to that video, um, Tina with Alex and um, the, I think it was the, your assistant in the home saying, you know, you got to set the high expectations and then they'll meet them. And I think that that's been our approach um, for Mira, you know, the whole way. And I, I, but I do think that advocacy is really um, parent advocacy or caregiver advocacy is kind of the key thread for all of it, no matter what the environment is that you choose, just um, advocating, you know, your child best, advocating for what they need, and then making sure that whatever that situation is, that it's, it's meeting those needs. Terrific. Boy, there's so many, uh, I want to get through our core questions, but there are more and more questions coming through in the live stream. So I want us to keep moving, but let's, uh, Tina, do you want to answer the question too? It sounds like you also had a, a public school experience with Alex. Can you just briefly uh, sure. respond? Sure. I'll tell, actually, we, we've done every every combination you can think of. Because she was born in England, and, and it was before we could map the human genome, it was diagnosed as dyspraxia. And the way that was uh, explained to me, that it was more of a um, neurological motor dysfunction with some delayed processing. So it's sort of ignorance is bliss, I don't know, or the cliche, or is extremely helpful, I should say, because what I ended up doing was having to speak to these, uh, I, I, I went, like, many of you to a public school system there. And I found out there were 60 children, six zero to one teacher. And I almost had a heart attack, right? Because I was, she had a private Montessori nursery school. She thrived in that. And I saw this British public school in our version of public school, I almost had, as I said, a heart attack. And I said, no way. So she ended up in a private school over there with, again, small classroom attention and what a difference that made, 11 kids, two, two kindergarten classes side by side with 11 kids. And she really did thrive. And then we moved to the United States. And so I put her into a, we, we had to repeat kindergarten because of the difference. And we had um, Alex put into a private Montessori because I thought how successful, um, you know, the, the nursery school had been. And I kind of bought into the philosophy. It was a disaster. OK, um, it was one of these things where this school did not understand her needs, isolated her um, completely. And it, and they were they were just not comfortable dealing with a child with disabilities. And I we all got very stressed, including Alex. And so we ended up moving her into the public school system in Connecticut for first grade. And what a wonderful experience. All of and she has carried on in public school ever since. Um, just like I'm echoing what everybody else said, it came down to advocacy. You're your child's ambassador. Um, sometimes, you know, you get tense, you get frustrated, but you keep saying to yourself, no, I'm representing her. And, and therefore, um, it's about collaboration. Um, I would say, yeah. And really, that's what it came down to an education and proactive, yeah. checking in more often, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. Um, yeah. And I can tell you that throughout the whole system, the reason why we made that video that I showed you was. Um, I have heard, and I don't know if other people have had this experience, but that support for special ed through uh, elementary school and middle school is quite good. And when you get to high school, it kind of drops off a cliff. I mean, that's what I was educated. And I kind of saw that with uh, 2020 and the pandemic. In ninth grade, she, it, I have empathy for teachers. They have so many students. And as you all know, with Kabuki syndrome, it's not one size fits all. It has to be tailored. Alex's highs are tremendously high. Her lows are very low. As someone said there, you need to create a navigational chart. And, and so what happened was I had to be that proactive parent again and say she was put in the wrong group in ninth grade. So then it became, look, you know, let's talk about this and switch her up. I will also say, um, in, in my experience with my daughter, I pushed them to throw her in the deep end. I keep saying, let her fail. I mean, push her. Let's see how far she can go, because I tended to find that with special ed, they have formulas and formulaic and they also get nervous. So they tend to, at least in my experience, they would either talk to her in this gentle way or this sort of prefab way. And I would get upset about it. And, and suddenly I'm like, no, no, talk to her normally. Push her. If she if we need to pull her back and redo regroup, we will but push her, you know. And yeah. so my goal for Alex was not to go a completely special ed route. I wanted her to be mainstreamed and I wanted to see how well she was going to do with that with support. And for so Alex, it's been successful. Let's, let's do this, Tina. That's a great, yeah. that's a great segue. I think um, one, one thread that is coming through, I, I'm seeing a lot of questions coming from folks that may have younger kids that are really excited and eager to hear from some of the panel. 
uh, because you know many of us have been down this path for quite a while. But yeah. there's a thread of setting the bar high, um, and that's something that uh, it, you can tease that out of these conversations. And for the folks who are listening, who may have younger kids who are starting this journey, that's a great theme that I'm hearing. But let's let's pivot for just a minute because um, you all regardless of whether you're homeschooling, private schooling, or public schooling, you're getting um, additional supports or resources likely. Some of you may be very heavily in a mainstream classroom with some supports. Others may be in a more of a special ed environment. Let's spend just a few minutes. Just uh, we, we want to go quick, so let's try to keep it succinct for um, those things that you're getting as far as additional supports. How are you, how are you sort of supplementing the core curriculum? And let's let's just for kicks, let's start with with Jody, because I'm kind of curious if you had OT needs or various specific things, how that works in a homeschool. So let's try to go quick so we can get to some of these questions. But Jody, why don't you start us off with this question? Certainly. So because we chose to homeschool through a virtual public charter school in California, he Joshua has had access to all services that any students in a public school would have. Perfect. So he always had a regular IEP that reflected really well his current skill levels, strengths, challenges, supports, needs, goals. He received excellent private, meaning one-on-one, -on -one, speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and educational audiology because he has a hearing loss. Um, homeschoolers, however, who choose not to be part of the public school system, even at home, would need to search out resources, but they're certainly there, right, through our uh, our medical insurance and uh, local advocacy, advocacy groups in other ways. Perfect. Great. Okay, Bonnie, you're up. So um, because Cameron's uh, transitioned to a college-based program, um, there's no um, IEPs anymore, so it is the program doesn't have OTPT speech per se. However, there is mentorships built in throughout the whole thing. So there is a house mentor to work on basic um, life skills, living, you know, laundry and all of those kinds of things and cooking. There are academic mentors to help the kids with the um, different classes that they're taking. And then, um, there's, you know, there's different um, social organizations such as Best Buddies and um, Unified Sports to help them be more interactive on the campus. And the awesome. other thing I'm going to say for all the kids in all the different um, areas and ages, uh, technology has improved a lot, which is really helps all of our um, neurodiverse kids. Um, when Cameron was little, no iPads, kids didn't have laptops on their desk. So all of that stuff, everybody should really look into and see what's best to support each child's differences and make their life easier. Terrific. Uh, let's go to, um, well, Dana, do you want to, do you want to speak to this? Sure. I'll just say, you know, I think because, um, because our kids are so complex, there's really a lot that they qualify for within the school district. And so taking advantage of those full services, um, I would say is the first step. Um, but in terms of outside support, you know, you've talked about PACER and how that wonderful that's been to our family. Um, but organizations like that exist everywhere. You know, as our journey has changed a little bit. When Mira was younger, it was more about like those private therapies, the occupational therapy, physical therapy. Now that she's getting more into the teen years, I'd say, um, that's less of a focus and it's more about sort of the um, adaptive extracurricular activities that provide her um, social support and um, other types of, um, you know, like exercise and balance in life skills. Yeah, great. Um, Tiffany, can you jump in for just a minute or so? Absolutely. And Zaina, I, um, I echo your sentiments. So I wasn't, I'm not sure if I was clear in the beginning, but Nasir is in a private school for kids with special needs. So, you know, all of his peers at school have, um, they're highly functioning, but they all have some sort of challenge. So um, there they have all of the resources that you could think of. He specifically is getting occupational therapy and speech. Um, they also have social skills classes um, because Nasir is very social. So he doesn't need help 
the way you think he would. Sometimes he needs help toning it down and how to, you know, share conversation, not just focus on sports or music or what you want to talk about, but how to share a conversation, how to read verbal and nonverbal communication. Um, and I have a, a very um, good relationship with the counselor there. So she gives feedback and tips for what to do at home and in the community. Um, so that's offered at his school. Also, Great. there's an organization called DOORS here in Maryland. It's the Division of Rehabilitation Services. And so they help with transitioning into the community. So out of high school and into the community, what does that look like? So they Great. do a thorough assessment with Nasir. Um, do you want to work? Do you want to go to a trade school? Are you ready for community college? Um, what are your likes and dislikes? They link you with employment. So right now he's working at, um, through his school, he's working at CVS. Um, so you know, all of those opportunities come through his school. So that's been awesome. Terrific. Awesome. And Tina, let's round this question out and then we're going to sure. move on to a different um, sort of area. Looking back when Alex was younger, um, yes, we the public school was fabulous. I kind of you know came in nervous thinking, oh, there's going to be budgetary issues. And I was so worried about would she get as much uh, as she needed, you know, for services. We talk about the gamut, like you all are talking about OT, speech, um, uh, PT, right? Then, yes, we had lunch bunch for socializing. We had the uh, school psychologist who was fabulous to help her, feel, you know, her feelings. We uh, There were so many things and it was about being really proactive and really involved. But what I came to me very clearly was there's only so many hours of the in the day, there's so many students, and she was going to need additional support outside it. So I was very, very proactive. Um, one day she came home, just a quick anecdote, and she came home from school and very frustrated in first grade and said, I hate art. I was horrified. I was like, what do you mean you hate art? So what, what it was, was I found out she she knew her shapes and everything, but she couldn't draw them. So, but my point was the art teacher hadn't picked that up because she had 20 kids in the class. So even though she had a para, she was miserable. So what I did was I got a wonderful art teacher on Saturdays to work one-on-one -on -one with her. And she knew that intellectually she understood everything. It was getting her to actually learn how to draw. And now she's she the best drawer in the world. No, but she likes art. She appreciates it. She learned about art history. So it was about supplementing, using maximizing what the public school system could offer but there was you knew there was going to be many more extracurricular hours yeah. that she was going to need perfect that's great um so uh i wanted to, i wanted to have a question uh, there's a broad sort of end question we've got about 10 minutes left for this module mm -hmm. and i want to ask the question about what advice you'd give uh, parents that are listening um when thinking about their their child's education but I'm looking at this laundry list of questions that are coming in. I'd like to try to meld that original base question with some of the things that I'm seeing on the theme. Um, and so there's a lot of questions around advocating to get services. So perhaps you can look at your, your answer um, and maybe just do a quick 30 to 60 second answer um, advice you would give, but maybe see if you could speak to a little bit of um, and I'm glad I spoke about Pacers benefits because some questions are, do I need to get a lawyer? Um, hopefully in most cases you don't, but there are a lot of questions around how did I start getting special ed services? Um, and, um, how do I get evaluated for special ed services? And so, you know, maybe as you give sort of the 30 to 60 second, sort of what advice you would give, maybe you could speak a little bit to that piece along the way. And let's, let's kick things off with, with Bonnie. And then just to give you guys a, a, a roadmap, we'll go down the list. Bonnie, then Jody, then Tiffany, then Dana, then Tina. So we'll just go straight down the list. So Bonnie, do you want to start? Sure. So um, just again, to echo what everybody else has said, you know, don't let anybody put a ceiling on your kid. Nobody has a crystal ball. So, you know, and, and no kid, there's no cookie cutter. So, you know, the school district knows that this is how they typically educate kid A, B, and C. Well, your kid's Z. So like, don't let them force your child to fit one of those. Talk to them about their strengths, their weaknesses, what, um, you know, try something. And, um, you know, as I tell a lot of the families I work with, I and IEP stands for individualized. And just because the school district's never done it before, doesn't mean it's not a realistic, good thing to try. You know, think outside the box, you know your kid best and, you know, make suggestions and push the envelope. You know, we're, we're um, all mother bears and, 
you know, Papa Bears, and you just got to go and say, listen, we got to try it. You've got, you know, show me a reason why this wouldn't work or we shouldn't do it. Perfect. Terrific. Jody. I echo so much of what uh, Bonnie just said. Um, so I won't say it again, but yeah, I think, I think one way to understand what options are, are to seek out as many parents who are in a similar situation, even in a similar geographic area. I feel like, uh, in the school district or even in, in California of our regional centers that support people with intellectual disabilities, you, um, those organizations don't just provide information. Like these are all the things that we could potentially offer you. And these are, um, all the supports that you might ever need. Like here's, here's your menu. Uh, they don't do that. And so finding as many parents as possible in similar situations, um, I've even found in our lives that finding parents of kids who are older than my son really helped because I could really pick their brains about, okay, so, you know, how did you get to where you are now and what were the different supports and what did the goals look like written for your child? So I, that's, that's how it's worked out really well for me is just seeking out as many parents as possible. Um, even teachers that I have personal relationship with, because I realize that's very different than being in the educational system with them and just asking as many questions as possible possible to really understand your options. Wonderful. Tiffany. I agree with so much of what Bonnie um, and Jody already said. And in fact, for our situation, um, we received a roadmap and actually the school we're in this year is right now from a parent who had already gone through the experience. So um, yes, leaning on people who have been there is a, is a great um, option. And also um, I highly recommend you get assessments done either through the school system. We had several assessments done at Kennedy Krieger um, because it's not what you think. Like nobody knows our kids like we do, but you can't argue with what's in black and white, what the assessment says. And so when you have that in hand and you go and you ask for resources, um, that makes the conversation um, a, a little easier, a little smoother. Um, so yes, lean on parents who've been there, um, make sure you have your assessment so you know where your kid is and what they need. Um, and, and yeah, just, just go to the district and say, hey, this is, this is what my kid needs. What can you offer? And start there. Terrific. Terrific. Okay, uh, Dana. Yeah, I, I mean, um, Jody, Tiffany, and Bonnie said so many wonderful tips. I, I don't have too much to add other than as much as you can involve your child themselves in the process is huge because, um, you know, they they learn to advocate for themselves earlier on. And also them being in the room in those meetings, them being, it's a lot harder for somebody to say no to them when they're right there sitting there. Also, you know, it's, I think we've always tried to approach these types of things as a team. Like we are part of a team with these folks. We're not, they're not our enemy. They're not, they're not our, um, we're not up in opposition to them. We're working together to try to find the right um, opportunity and the optimal success for, um, for our child. And so a team approach, I think is, is a good approach. And then finally, just remembering these things are um, legal rights not privileges. And so while you don't need to find, um, you know, a lawyer necessarily, we do have a right um, to a free and appropriate education for our children um, and that they get um, what's individualized needs for them. Yeah, absolutely. Tina. I don't want to say like they said, like she said, but I will tell you, uh, just add a little color to this. I mean, I, I didn't have any other parents to talk to and Alex was not officially diagnosed with Kabuki until she was 10. Um, so I was operating off of dyspraxia. I will tell you, yes, being the tiger mom, um, I ended up being like chairman of the PTO to get involved with the school, be involved. I also, I really can't stress this enough. If you feel that there are, and this is for the, for parents of younger children, if there's like a blanket sort of one size fits all messaging that you're getting, I would find, I found one woman and she she was, I called her the Annie Sullivan to Alex's Helen Keller. I mean, she, she really believed in Alex. She read her, she understood her. And Alex never did recess in third grade because she held her to the table and said, I know you can do this. And they had their own rapport and they're still, in, still working together, believe it or not, on math skills and that kind of thing. But this one woman, and I feel if you can get at least one teacher that you can, as uh, Dana mentioned, you have a special rapport with and you're a team, yes. But if there's at least one or two teachers that you can really 
really connect with and they help you navigate through the system, um, it's extremely helpful. And, and the more proactive you are involved in that academic arena and working, as you said, stressing that it's a team, but it's about following up and following through. Yeah, that's that's terrific. So so well said for all of you. And um, it's just it's it's wonderful that we're at this stage in 2022 where, you know, 10 years ago and you, you just sort of said this, Tina, like there weren't these forums. You were really sort of in an island. And even earlier, there wasn't support groups online where you could say, hey, what are you doing? What did you do? And so um, I can tell you and assure you the folks that are listening are are sort of just devouring this content. Um, there Daniel, are, there, Daniel, can oh. I tell, just tell you one more anecdote? And I think it's so important for parents with the younger children. It's one thing when you have the IEPs and you have your meetings, okay, and you're meeting with everybody. But one of the most important things for Alex, Alex's success was the one-on-one -on -one with the teachers. And I'll give you two very quick examples. One was she; they thought maybe she had autism because we didn't have the Kabuki, you know, um, diagnosis. They didn't know. They were trying to figure her out. And for instance, she would look out a window during circle time when she was like in fourth grade, okay? They thought she wasn't paying attention because teachers will go on the knowledge that they have and their own experiences. So they didn't know how to read her. And this wonderful teacher I told you who was her advocate went, watched her in class and then asked Alex, like some one of the other mothers talked about involving your own child in the conversation. And she said, Alex, why do you keep looking out the window when everyone's looking at the teacher? And Alex in fourth grade turned to her and said, I can't concentrate looking at her mouth. I look at the tree so I can listen. And then that changed the whole dynamic in the classroom, yeah. the whole perspective of the teacher with Alex. It wasn't that she wasn't paying attention. So I'm saying yeah. one more quickie is that another one, Quick. she wanted to learn trumpet. And I could tell when the, this young you, new teacher was Did talking. Did you say Trump or trumpet? Trumpet, trumpet. I'm trying okay. to talk fast. And, um, and, and we... When he was going down the line of these new little kids, they were like in fourth grade going, trying to hold the trumpet up and play a note. Okay. His voice changed when he got to Alex and it was almost like he was talking down to her. Okay. And I know he didn't mean it that way. He was trying to be supportive. It was kind of, okay, dear, let's see you try. And I said, wait a minute, this is a kid who plays piano by ear. Okay. So I showed him after that, I was very nice. This is a parent advocate. And I pulled him aside and I said, do you know that Alex probably reads music and these kids don't? And he was surprised. I said, look, I just want you to understand the reason why she's struggling is because of trying to manipulate her fingers with yep. the trumpet sure, and holding sure. up a heavy trumpet, right? Muscle tone. Sure. And I said, if, and so we end up having this lovely conversation and his whole attitude towards her changed. And that's what I'm saying about teacher interpretation and that dialogue is so important. Terrific. Awesome. Okay. Thank you for that. That's, that's terrific. Uh, that, uh, that theme throughout the session real quickly, we're just a minute or so behind. There are a lot of questions that will be very uh, helpful and uh, responded to in a later section of the afternoon. There are a lot of questions around transition, living independently, and uh, stay tuned because that's coming up next. So um, that's a great segue for me to introduce the next segment. I want to thank all the parents for participating in the panel. Um, it's been a joy to facilitate the conversation.